Okay. All right. Uh, so good afternoon. Let's get started. Um, <clears throat> today's topics is, topic is models for sequential data. So we're going to look at how to analyze stuff that comes in a sequence, like language or music or time series. Uh, one word before we start. Uh, some of you may have been slightly, um, may be slightly tired by now of all the huge amounts of math I've been showing you and all the difficult stuff, and maybe slightly intimidated by the homework. Um, the good news is that this week's homework, uh, which is about last week, is the last uh, new homework there is. So next week's homework is about the practice exam. We'll be reviewing the practice exam. Which means that from this lecture onwards, there will be no more homework about the lectures. Which means that there will be no more exam questions about the difficult stuff. So the exam que if there's an exam question about something that you have to really know, you have to really do the math or work through the algorithm. Uh, I only make exam those kinds of exam questions about stuff you've done in the homework. So if you've done the homework so far, you've got all those exam questions covered. And I'm still going to show you a lot of math, sorry. But it won't be, uh, and it will still be in the exam, but it won't be in the exam in the, in the sense that you need to understand the math. So if you don't get the math, if something comes up and you think, well, I get the general idea, but I don't get the math, then you're fine for the exam. And if you're going to do machine learning later, you have to dive into to the math anyway. But um, So just to put your mind at ease, the next four lectures, you can relax about the math. That's just what I wanted to say. Um, so this is the plan. We're going to start by talking about sequential data in just in general. What kind of, well, what does it look like? What kind of uh, data can we expect if we're analyzing sequential data? And uh, what kind of things do we need to take into account? Then we are going to look, as it were, again at Naive Bayes, but from a slightly different perspective. Naive Bayes is a very popular algorithm in spam classification, but it's not quite used in the way we've discussed it so far. And it actually makes a lot more sense. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to explain it if you look at your data not as feature vectors, but as sequences of text. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to discuss Markov models, which are kind of generalization of naive base in some uh, from some perspective and then briefly we are going to talk about embedding models uh, which I can't preface in one sentence so you'll just have to see what that means and then the whole second part I have reserved for discussion of recurrent neural nets specifically LSTMs which are a type of recurrent neural net, which are probably the most popular and most successful day way of dealing with sequential data that we have today. And this is one of those deep learning methods. So we're going to go back into deep learning. So let's get started. Sequences. Um, sequences come in a couple of uh, varieties. So let's just split out the categories roughly so we know what we're talking about. Probably the simplest form of sequence is the uh, one-dimensional numeric time series. So what we see here, for instance, just as a random uh, example, uh, this is for, I think, a number of weeks, the uh, number of sunspots observed in the sun. The sun goes through these cycles, and if you observe it with a special telescope, you can see the sunspots appearing, which are bits of the sun that are slightly darker than the surrounding area. And the number of sunspots goes through this sort of cyclical behavior. So what you have here is just a bunch of numbers, and they are arranged in a row. So it's a one-dimensional numeric time series. Uh, you can have n-dimensional numeric time series. So for every time step, you can have two numbers, for instance, instead of one. So what I've plotted here is the, uh, oh, the second one. is So this is the FTSE 100, and this is, I think, the Amsterdam index, some kind of financial index. I'm no financial expert, but these are sort of one, some, well, these, these kinds of numbers about stock exchanges that you read in the newspaper. So you can plot one of them against another one of them, 
for a, for a range of days, and then you get this kind of thing. So here we have a, se a series of two-dimensional vectors. So I have three-dimensional data, but one dimension is time, so it's sorted in this dimension, and the rest is just vectors as we've seen them already. And you can have more than two dimensions, but then you can't really plot it anymore. Uh, you can also have what we call symbolic time series, which is basically what we call the categorical data in the, uh, what we've so far, so far called categorical data. It's more often referred to as symbolic data when you're talking about sequential, uh, when you're talking about sequences. I don't know why. It's just uh, a sequence of symbols and you have a vocabulary of symbols like the vocabulary of all possible words, and you observe a sequence of those symbols. It's, it's as simple as that. That's a one-dimensional symbolic time series, or a symbolic sequence. Uh, you can also have multiple, symbol, uh, multiple symbols per time step. For instance, if you get a um, sequence of text where the words have been annotated with their, uh, what we call a part of speech tag, so the type of word it is, here, cat has been annotated with the type, with the part of speech tag noun. So here we have a two-dimensional, two-dimensional as it were. Or for every time step, at least we get two symbols: one from one vocabulary, all words in the language, and one from another vocabulary, all pause tags, part of part of speech tags. So that's just an example of, of uh, uh, how you can get multiple symbols per uh, per time step. And you can even get very difficult, uh, very complicated symbolic stuff like music, which has multiple time steps and usually multiple uh, notes that can be played at the same time on one instrument. So on a piano, you can play two notes at the same time. Or at some time step, you might, well, it doesn't happen here, but at some time step, you might play no notes at all. Uh, you might even just lean on the keyboard and play all the notes on the keyboard at once. And then in some types of music, you even have different voices. You might have a piano and a violin and uh, uh, something else, and a voice, maybe. Uh, so this is very difficult to work out exactly, if you're dealing with music, how to represent it as a symbolic sequence. But it is symbolic. It is discrete. You have a fixed number of notes, finite number of notes, and a fixed time steps. Um, so we won't go into this much further, but this is kind of a difficult problem, how to represent this as a symbolic sequence. But it makes sense as a sequence because the time dimension is very important. Then there's a, uh, an important distinction in your, uh, if you have sequential data, whether you have one sequence of data, like this, you have, oh yeah, I shouldn't do that with my laptop. Well, you have one big time series. Your whole data set is just one long time series, like the sunspots we saw earlier. Or you have several series, several sequences. Like in spam classification, if we look at a typical spam classification data set, but we don't do feature extraction, so we just look at the raw emails without extracting any features, then we get basically a bunch of emails, and they are labeled ham or spam. And from this, we have to somehow build a spam classifier. <coughs> so now we have a set of sequences. Uh, and each sequence in isolation, we will try to predict. But there is not a really important time dimension between the sequences. I mean, emails are timestamped, but the timestamp doesn't really matter for this kind of stuff. So. You can see this as an isolated example. It doesn't really matter that this came before this. But within each example that you have, the time dimension is very important. So that's opposed, as opposed to the case where you have just one time series. And what you're trying to do is to predict at some point what the next value in the time series is going to be. So that's usually when you have one time series, uh, usually your task ends up being something like predicting at this point what the next value is going to be. So if you have, for instance, um, traffic to your website, you might want to, in order to do load balancing, you might want to predict the amount of visitors your website is going to have. Or if you have, uh, you're selling something, you might want to predict, based on the season and based on, on trends, 
how much you're going to sell in the next month so that you can adjust your hiring uh, policy and um, plan accordingly, basically. Um, so those are all cases where you don't have separate instances. You have one big series and you're trying to, at each point, you're trying to predict the next value at each point in time, which you can turn into a data set like we're used to. So let's say here we're trying to predict the next uh, number of sunspots, given this history. Uh, what you can do in order to use basically all of the methods we've already seen, you can do feature extraction. And the simplest way is to say, well, I'm predicting the value at time t. So I'm going to use it my f as my features, the value at time t minus 1, t minus 2, and well, this should be t minus 3. I'm going to pr use the previous three values and use that to predict the next value. And in a lot of um, cases, these are this can make quite good predictors, even if you use very simple, like a linear uh, algorithm, a linear classifier, or, or a linear regression to predict this value from these three values. Uh, you can make very good predictions. For instance, if you look at the weather, if you predict for tomorrow's weather, today's weather, you just make a predictor that always predicts today's weather, I think you get something like 80% accuracy already. It's already a very good weather predictor. So often this is quite a good... Uh, uh, approach. The only problem is that you have to be very careful when you start doing stuff like this about validation and uh, testing. Because you can't just use this as a plain data set and just stick it into a scalar and then assume it works. Because there are some things that end up that you might end up doing here that cannot happen in the real setting that you're trying to test for. So I showed you this advice uh, for a couple of weeks ago. Think about the real-world use case. So if you're trying to predict sales, let's say these are sales data, you're trying to predict sales data from the last two uh, items that you have. If I shuffle this data, the rows, and then split it into a test set and a training set, then if I'm looking at one of these rows, for instance, in the... Uh, uh, test set. Uh, now let me put that differently. If I so if I shuffle this data, this data, I split it into a test and a training set. I train a classifier, and I start testing it. I might have seen because I shuffled things. I might have seen during training things that, from the test perspective, were happening in the future, because I shuffled this. So there might be things from the future in my test set. <coughs> Normally that doesn't happen because these rows are all independent examples that aren't related, but now they're related by this time dimension. So essentially what you need to do is make sure you, uh, once you set up this data set, that the time dimension, that you honor it, that you keep it in the same, uh, in the same order. Uh, which leads to something called walk forward, with forward validation. And we'll look at, uh, which is a, a kind of variation on cross validation if you have a time dimension. And we'll look at the um, hyperparameter optimization or the hyperparameter selection scenario first. So we have some training data. It's ordered in time. We split off our test data. We'll deal with that later. And now we, we want to somehow, based on this training data, we want to build a classifier or a system or a regression system, anything that will help us predict any point along this time based on everything that came before it. But never based on what comes after. Because in the real use case that we're going to see later, or that we're going to use this system later, the real use case, we will never have access to data from the future. So whatever we do when we're building this, we always need to make sure that if we're testing on this point here, we only use the data that comes before it to train our system. So basically what we do is we pick some point in the data, we train on all the data before it, we check how well it does on this point, 0 0.4, and then we move up one point, we forget our model from this run entirely, we train on this data, <coughs> and then we test on this point. So we test always on one point and we test the mean squared error or the accuracy or whatever we're, we're trying to predict. And so on and so on. And we do that for the whole training data. 
we get a whole list of errors, and then we average that, and that's our estimated error for this particular model we were testing. And then we can test lots of models, we can test lots of hyperparameters, we can test lots of ways of training, uh, of treating the data, lots of ways of um, extracting maybe features from this part of the data. All these things we can try. And then we come up with a good model. And then we go and then we can look at this test set, right? So the test set, we don't want to overuse the test set, we only want to use it once. That's why we withheld it, but we withheld specifically the last part of the test set in time. Because if we only want to look at that once, then we need to use this part. And then in the test set, we can do the same thing as we did earlier during the walk forward validation. We pick one item in the test set, we train on everything before it, which in the first step is just our training data. We get a value here. And we move one step up. But at that point, we are allowed to use still everything before it. So we're still allowed to use uh, this point, which was in the test set. We are now allowed to use in the training data. And so on, and we move up and up and up until the last point in our data set, and then we average again the errors that we get here. So when testing uh, the Okay, that's a good question. So um, this is all talking about training. So the question is, what happens when you start using your model during inference, as we say, or, or you do it during production? Uh, basically, in this setting, we assume that the model somehow uses all the data that comes before it. Basically, because this is modeling this, the uh, situation you assume you have in production, where we have a point now, and we have all the data up to the point now, and no data from the future, because that doesn't uh, work. Um, so that's sort of the point we're, the, the thing we're, we're um, modeling here. So we have some method, some pipeline. And that's ultimately what comes out of this, is a pipeline that looks at all of this data and trains a model to predict the future point. Um, so to give, a, give you the most general possible solution, to give you the most general view of things, yes, we've built a model that needs to be retrained, as it were, for every point which, as I guess you're thinking, is very expensive to every time you want to make a prediction, you retrain the whole model. Um, but that's just to give us the most general view. You can just say, uh, train your model every month or train your model every day, but that still fits this view, right? So if you're training here, the model is allowed to ignore this data point, to make it easier to learn, to make it faster to learn. But in terms of this validation setting, we... Uh, Assume that it has access at least to all of this data, whether it uses it or not. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the next question is: um, <coughs> Could you say you're just training it on the last few time steps, which is essentially what we're doing uh, here? We're just training it on the last three time steps. Uh, so that's allowed, but according to the test protocol, you have access to the whole data and you're allowed to just look at the last three points if that makes it faster or more efficient. Oh, uh, you had a question? Um, so wouldn't this just make uh, uh, the model more efficient? Uh, like, for example, say we have our training data and we have every component of it. Mm -hmm. And now we just want to use time. Like, what, is, what is the benefit of doing that? Yeah, uh, so the question is, um, <coughs> what do we do if our training data has um, or if our problem is somehow cyclical in nature, what you might get, for instance, if you are running a travel agency, then you will see very seasonal behavior. In the summer, you get a lot of business, but in the winter, you don't get a lot of business, so you need to plan for that. You need to predict that. Um, and in that case, well, the first thing you want to make sure is that your whole data is big enough that it contains a few of these cycles. Otherwise, you just don't have enough data to observe this. Um, and what you may want to do then uh, at this point is weigh, uh, weigh these values a little bit lower because these are essentially 
uh, the data you had, as it were, when you started your company, when you didn't have enough uh, experience. Um, but these, ac these essentially represent less realistic uh, a less realistic, a less realistic simulation of the situation that you're trying to 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 simulate, because in the real world, when you're going to go into production, this is all of your data. You have lots of data, <coughs> and here you're just optimizing for situations where you don't have a lot of data. So you can say, in my test protocol, I'm going to uh, basically. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, actually, in your test protocol, it's not a big problem because you've, you're only testing on the last bits of your data. So you would need to make sure that your test set is big enough that it contains these cycles, that it contains both winter and summer. Otherwise, you're not testing uh, realistically. Um, and then in validation, sorry for skipping around so much, you may want to just skip these parts. Say, I'm going to only start from the half point of my data set because these this is realistic, I don't want to optimize for these situations because I have enough data anyway. So that's important when you are dealing with sequences to uh, keep these things in mind. And if you're confused what about what's fair and what's honest, uh, just make sure always to think about your production system or your imagined production system, your use case, what, what's going to happen when this, yeah, what's this model going to be used for? And given that, what would be a fair way to to test my model, because I'm ultimately I'm trying to predict the performance of this model when it goes into production. Okay, so the question is, are these, is this one model or two models? Uh, so this is one model, say, so, well, um, or rather, uh, during the validation phase, this is like cross-validation, you are picking your model. So you're saying, am I going to use support vector machines or uh, k-nearest neighbors, right? And you check only on the training data using this kind of validation scheme. You just test both of them. First, you train your support vector machine here and here and here and here, and you average these. You get a value for your support vector machine. You do the same for k-nearest neighbors. You get a value for your k-nearest neighbors. And then you say, well, k-nearest neighbors works better, so I'm going to use k-nearest neighbors. And you also pick a feature extraction method and lots of others, so you have a whole pipeline from your training set to your validation point. And then you go with that model, you go look at your test set. So in that sense, uh, that's, uh, that's how that works. Uh, let me check the time. Uh, all right. So let's say we have uh, now, we are in the situation where we have separate sequences for each instance in our data set, so we don't have to worry about the walk-forward validation stuff. And our instances are represented by bits of text. And we go back to the base classifier, so we have some observed data, and we want to know the probability that, given this observed data, the probability that the email is spam. But we're not going to do feature extraction, we are going to model the text directly. How do we do this? Well, first we need to make this a bit more specific. So we model this bit of text as a sequence of words. And we say for now we will just assume that all emails are the same length. And we model the email as a sequence of random variables. So the email is random variable w1, w2, w3, w4, w5, w6. And each random variable can take any word in our language. So we have a vocabulary, let's say we pick 10,000 words and that's our basic vocabulary. Each random variable can take with some probability one of, the, one of those words. And some words like A are, uh, where is it, A are more likely than prize, which is probably more likely than congratulations. Uh, but in general, we just have a sequence of outcomes. And there's no, these are not independent, these are highly dependent, so you have one is much more likely to be followed by price than by desk. Uh, so this is just a sequence of random variables that are not independent and not distributed the same way. And we are looking for the probability, because we can turn this around using Bayes' rule. Ultimately, what we're looking for is the probability of seeing the things we've seen 
given that the class is spam. We multiply this by the prior probability of spam, and then we get basically this. And then we can compare that to the probability of ham, and whichever is highest, highest is the one we classify. So this is what we're looking for, this distribution. How do we uh, model that? And what we can do to make this more uh, feasible to work this out, because we don't really have any uh, gr uh, grip on this, is we use the chain rule, but not the chain rule that you're all familiar with, hopefully by now, but a completely different chain rule. Sorry, sometimes these things get the same name. We use the chain rule of probability, which has absolutely nothing to do with the chain rule of uh, calculus. Basically, if you have four, you have the joint probability of four, well, four to keep it simple, the joint probability of a sequence of random variables, or any collection of random variables, you can use the uh, product rule to split out conditionals. So what you can do here is you can say this joint probability is equal to the probability on these last three, conditional on the first, times the probability of W1. So this is basically the product rule of probability. If you haven't seen this before, just take my word for it. This uh, is true. Uh, this is basically the definition of conditional probability rewritten. Uh, so we're doing this except uh, with a bunch more random variables. And then we can do the same thing again. So now we split off. We make this conditional on W2. And we split off this part into a separate, uh, separate factor. And we do the same thing again, and then we get this. What this says essentially is that the joint probability is just the product of the probabilities of the individual words in our sentence, conditioned on the words that came before it. Now, to be fair, you could do this in any order. You could do it in reverse order, so you can condition it on the words in the future. Uh, but this is actually, this helps us, because language is, uh, it tends to be ordered in time, and it tends to be uh, words tend to depend on the words that come before it, not the words after it, because, well, when we speak, we hear, hear words in sequence. So th it makes sense to take the joint probability and to decompose it in this way by conditioning every word on only the words that come before it. So we haven't uh, made any assumptions yet. We haven't done anything yet. We haven't changed anything. All we've done is rewritten this value into these values, but they're exactly the same values. So it looks like this. If we, with a little bit of uh, abusive notation, let's say, instead of saying W1 is, uh, W4 is prize, let's just put down prize and assume that we know what we mean. You basically get what you uh, uh, in order to get the probability of a sentence or the probability of an email, what you want to estimate or find are these kinds of probabilities. So you have this is a sentence you've observed so far. Congratulations, you have won a something. What's the probability of that something? Conditioned on all the words that came before it. Skip this. Which is quite a complicated and deep function, deep probability distribution, right? It's not, very, it's not something simple. Like if I read a sentence like this, the man fell out of the something, then the man fell out of the cycling is just ungrammatical. It doesn't make any sense, even on a grammatical level. So that has a very, very low probability. You would almost never see something like that. The man fell out of the swimming pool is grammatical, but physically not really possible. I can't really conceive of what that would look like. The man fell out of the fish tank is physically possible, but unlikely. Something very weird must have happened before that takes place. But so this is a reasonable probability already. And then the man fell out of the window. That's already quite a, a, a reasonable sentence to see. So this, this word should have the highest probability. So this is quite a deep function. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
uh, quite a deep and, and uh, deep function that sort of encodes lots of things about grammar, about meaning, and about the world. And we're going to try and approximate that using something called the Markov assumption, which is like the naive base assumption, one of these really crude assumptions that just eliminates all of this complexity I was talking about. Basically, we say whenever we get this big conditional sequence, we just assume blindly that the probability of the word prize depends only on the two words, or the probability of any word, depends only on the two words preceding it. So this probability is equal to this probability. The fact there are the congratulations and you and have before this is somewhere in the history uh, doesn't enter into the probability. And like naive base, this is not true. Uh, this is not a true uh, assumption, but it does make things a lot simpler. And I've picked two as a random thing. You can also set the, the memory, as it were, to three or four words or one word. But for now, let's go for two words as an example. So that's the Markov assumption. And what you get then, when you have the one to analyze the joint probability of a sentence like this, you can first break it up using the chain rule into these conditional probabilities for each word. And then you can remove from the conditional anything but the last two words. So the probability of this sentence under this Markov model it's just the probability of prize, of seeing the word prize after the word 1a, times the probability of seeing the words a after seeing the words have one, times the probability of seeing the word one after observing the word you have, and so on down to the sentence. And at the end, we don't have any prior words to condition on, so for the uh, first two words of the sentence, we use uh, first an unconditional probability and then a probability conditioned on just one word. So now we have very simple conditional probabilities, which we can just estimate from a big corpus of text, big bag of text, which we call a corpus. So you get a big bag of text, and for every one of these things, you just estimate this probability as the number of times you have seen the first two words in the conditional, the number of times you have seen the words 1a, and you count the number of times you have seen the sequence 1a prize, and you divide this by this, and that should give you the probability, if you see the words 1a, that it will be followed by the word prize. So suddenly we are down to a very simple estimation technique to get a probability of a sentence. Uh, so one thing you can do with this is you can sample from it, which is always a lot of fun. Basically what you do is you build one of these Markov models, so you basically count all these frequencies in your text, you pick some starting words, and then you, uh, so you pick a small seed sequence of text that you start from. You look at the last two words, which gives you a distribution on the word that will follow, right? And you sample from that distribution. You add it to your, uh, to your text, so you're building a text word by word. You sample from that distribution, you add another word. And you have two more words. You have one more word. You look at the last two words. You get this distri distribution. You sample another word, and so on. And that's called a Markov chain, because you're chaining these uh, conditional rules. And what you get out of that is something that is uh, surprisingly resembling natural language. This is from a website called schmipsum.com. It's in the slides, the URL, in the PDF slides. And this is based on Shakespeare. So you train on a corpus of Shakespeare to estimate these probabilities. And then you sample uh, n-words at the time. I don't know how, what order Markov model they use here. And you get something on a word level that looks like, uh, doth grace that I beseech your high majesty with tears mine ear, prithee tell her you both of Rome of your will. So it's sort of almost grammatical, not quite. And if you set the order of the Markov model higher, you need a lot more data, a lot more data. It increases exponentially. But if you're Google and you have access to the whole, whole internet worth of text, then you can go up to something like order nine Markov models, and then you get really quite realistic estimates of this probability, and therefore quite realistic uh, language. So that's one fun thing, uh, but I haven't really 
uh, I sort of ignored this conditioning on a class. So if you have uh, if you have uh, something like a spam classification task, basically what you do is you condition this. You're not looking for the, the probability of the sentence as is. You're looking for the probability of the sentence given that the class is spam uh, and the probability of the sentence given that the class is ham. So you're starting joint probabilities already conditioned on a class. Then you apply the chain rule. You just get the same thing except the class is always in there on the right. And you can just estimate these Markov probabilities uh, by counting not the absolute frequencies in your data, but counting the frequencies in the part of your data that is labeled as spam. So you collect all your spam emails, you estimate these frequencies, you get an estimate for the probability of your sentence. Then you look at all your ham emails, you estimate the frequencies, you estimate the probability of the sentence of your data. Then you look which is higher, multiplied by the class probability, and that gives you a classification. A uh, few final comments if you're actually going to do this or if you actually think about applying this to something. Um, well, firstly, if you do a zero order Markov model, so you don't condition on anything, you just remove the conditioning, conditional, you're basically doing naive Bayes. You're saying every word is independent. It's not quite naive Bayes as we've discussed it before because there are some technical differences if you work out how this feature extraction naive Bayes compares to this. It's very slightly different. Uh, but not in very meaningful ways. And when you're doing this for spam classification, actually the zero order Markov model doesn't do, usually doesn't do conceivably, uh, especially worse than the first order or second order Markov models. So these conditional things actually don't give you enough, uh, give you very much information about whether or not your email is spam. You can just look at individual word fre frequencies. Um, Short documents, documents are sort of the, the general term for these things like emails or sentences. Um, under these Markov models, short documents have very high probabilities compared to longer documents, which is something you need to correct for if you're going to compare different documents. doesn't matter if you do spam classification because you're only comparing the distribution of this email given that it's spam to this email given that it's ham. So the length is the same, so you don't need to worry about this. If you're comparing one document to another document, then you need to uh, take into account the length of the document, uh, usually by conditioning on it. And as we saw, saw before in the naive base story, that uh, sometimes you have events that aren't in your data set, which are very problematic because then this whole sequence of uh, probabilities uh, has one zero in it. This whole product of probabilities has one zero in it, and the whole thing becomes zero. Uh, so you need to uh, deal with that, uh, and Laplace smoothing is the simplest way to do to do that. So essentially, if you do simple add one Laplace smoothing, you take these frequencies, and you always add one. So if there's uh, one a prize has never occurred in your data set, this frequency is zero. You still add one. So then everything that had frequency zero now has frequency one after smoothing. And in order to um, make sure that everything still normalizes to one, you need to add a little term to your uh, denom uh, denominator, which is basically the size of your vocabulary uh, raised to the power of the number of uh, items you have here. So the uh, cube, of your cube of the size of your vocabulary, and then you can be sure that this all normalizes to one again, if you sum it over all uh, trigrams. Uh, I think I'm once again a little optimistic in my planning. So let's have the break now. So we've done sequences and we've done Markov models. We'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll quickly run through embeddings and recurrent neural networks after the break. All right, let's get started again. Find your seat. Uh, so I'm have to going to have to go through embeddings uh, a little bit quickly. Apologies if things are a bit rushed. Basically, so we have now have quite a nice language model, quite a nice model for sentences, which gives us probabilities over sentences. The problem 
is that um, if we have this in our data set, and then we see this, uh, these will tell us nothing about each other, right? These express exactly the same thing. Congratulations, you have won a prize. Congrats, a reward has been awarded to you. Um, but they share almost no words. The word you is the only word that occurs in both sentences. So until you see lots and lots of uh, examples of both, you will not know that these sentences have similar probability or mean similar things. And if you have this in your data set lots of times, but this only in your test set, then you will not see that they have similar probability or that, the, uh, that they both indicate that the probability of spam is high. Because we are modeling words as separate entities. We are not modeling in any way the fact that words have similar mean may have similar meanings. And that's what embeddings are going to help us do. Uh, embeddings, specifically the embedding method we're going to talk about called word to vec is based on the distributional hypothesis, which states uh, this. Words that occur in the same context often have similar meanings. So for instance, uh, no, not for instance, um, basically if you have a word and you determine a probability distribution on the words that are near it, that surround it, how likely is each word to be? near this given word, that distribution is a proxy for its meaning. The fact that a word often has a uh, noun either side of it can make it a verb, and the fact that a word often uh, has the word congratulations and one in its context means that it might talk about some kind of context and what might be awarded in the context. So that's a basic distributional hypothesis means that you can use this, uh, this, uh, the, the context of a word or the likely context words of a word as a uh, proxy for its meaning. That's what we're going to use. Uh, and to start, just uh, to remind you, uh, we need the concept of a one-hot vector, which is a vector that is zero everywhere except in one point where it's one. And we are, uh, to start with, we are going to encode our words as one-hot vectors. So let's say we have 10,000 words. We make a, length, a vector of length 10,000. This isn't quite 10,000, but it's a very long vector. So we make a, as, uh, a vector as long as the number of words we, uh, we choose in our vocabulary. So we just choose the most frequent 10,000 words, right? And then for each word, we just assign a random point in this, uh, in this vector. So for the word cat, we just pick this point. Maybe we order them alphabetically. It doesn't really matter. The word mat has this one hot vector, and the has this one hot vector, and so every word has one, uh, has its own one hot vector. So that's how we represent the words to start with. And then we build a very simple neural network, which looks a little bit like an autoencoder, but it's not quite an autoencoder, which has uh, as uh, where we uh, we put one of these one hot vectors as the input. So the input is as big as our vocabulary, in this case, ten thousand. The output is also as big as our vocabulary, so our target output is also going to be one of these one-hot vectors. In the middle, we have a very small layer with, uh, let's say, 300 nodes is a common value to use. And then the input is linear, so we just have a linear, uh, linear hidden layer, and the output is softmax. And just to refresh your memory, a softmax layer ensures that all the outputs here, this, the output is not a one-hot factor, the output can have numbers on all of these 10,000 units. The softmax activation ensures, modifies those units and ensures that they all sum to one. So what we get here is a probability, a probability distribution on all 10,000 words. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a word here and make the network predict, predict a probability distribution on context words. So given the word cat, what is the probability that for each word that it occurs in the context, that it occurs nearby the word mat? And context we just define as a fixed uh, distance. So we take what we call a sliding window of five words. We pick the middle word as our target word, which is going to be x. 
And if, these, uh, if the word shall occurs in the context of the word compare, then the word shall should have a reasonably high uh, probability on the output. So we take a big corpus of text, and we basically slide this window along, and we create this training data set. So for the word compare, we have we put the word compare on the input four times for every time we, it occurs in the text. And we put it four context words in, to the left and to the right. We put it on the output. So this is our training data that we're going to feed to this neural network. Where here, actually, I wrote compare. But this is actually what we're going to feed is one of these, is the one hot vector for the word compare. So this is just big training data. And if we have a big enough text, then lots of words will occur multiple times. If the word compare occurs another time, then you will see another little cluster of four things and four outputs. Four compares and four context words for the word compare. We feed that through the neural network. And hopefully it learns to actually predict reasonably well this context distribution. So given one of these words, D, what is the probability over all words that it will occur in the context of D, where context is defined like a five uh, uh, a window of uh, size five. And let's say we train this, and let's say it works well, so we get a decent loss. It predicts these words well. And we throw away the top layer, and we only use the bottom part, and we use it as an encoder. So here we feed in our word, then we get this 300 size 300 vector, dense vector, here. And we use that as a representation of our word. Because we know, if you have the right weights, from this you can compute this uh, output distribution. This somehow, in some way, this encodes all the meaning in the word, the meaning of our input word that is in this output distribution. This is a compressed version of this output distribution. So we don't need that actual distribution anymore. We can just use this size 300 word vector. So we do this on a big, uh, big corpus. And then we can have a look and see what this, in this space, in this 300 dimensional space, how words, uh, how words distribute, how words behave in that space. And you see some interesting things. It's a very famous example for word to vec uh, Basically, if you look at this space, what you see is that, for instance, for words that are typically female and typically male, they tend to distribute, uh, there tends to be a, a sort of fixed direction and fixed distance between them. So there's this vector between man and woman, which we can compute by embedding the word man, embedding the word woman, and subtracting one from the other, and then we get this vector in this 300-dimensional space. We take that vector and we add it to king. We, see we end up in some point, and if we see which word is close, which word has an embedding vector that is close to that point, we see that it's queen. So what you basically get is you get a vector that you can add to lots of male gendered words, like uncle and uh, king, and it translates it automatically into the female version or vice versa. Uh, you can also get a plural vector, so from king to kings, from queen to queens. Um, so th uh, yeah, after all this training, the words in this embedding space, they tend to be laid out quite neatly according to the meaning, according to the semantics of the word. So what you get for free, or for free, well, what you get after training is a 300-dimensional di vector representing each word in a way that from which you can uh, extract meaning basically using linear algebra. So the, these are very useful vectors to have in, uh, yeah, in, in, in um, uh, deep learning applications. Let's get this. So it creates embedding vectors for words. Distances and directions tend to reflect semantic meaning after training. And they're a great starting point for deep learning projects on natural language. And you don't have to train it yourself, because Google has already done it. They've trained a uh, nice embedding model with 300-dimensional embedding vectors. 
on their huge amounts of data using their huge amounts of computers, and you can download that. So you can download standard embeddings for your words and use those in your own, uh, in your own applications. So that's very nice. So that's embeddings. So now on to our last topic, recurrent neural networks. Oh, well, that was a break. Um, recurrent neural networks are a uh, deep learning method, like, well, word effects also sort of not deep learning, but uh, neural network uh, learning. So we need to think a little bit more about how to represent, how we represent these sequences that we're dealing with, especially symbolic sequences, as tensors in this, these tensor uh, frameworks. So we already talked about one-hot encodings. Uh, here's a simpler example. So let's say we have some music with just one octave and no, uh, no black keys. So we just have uh, seven notes, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And then we can represent a tune like this. So we get a size seven one-hot vector representing these notes, and we can represent a tune like this as a sequence of one-hot vectors. And a sequence of vectors you can also represent as a matrix. So you get a matrix as high as your vocabulary is and as long as the number of time steps you have. And that's what you use to represent a, a sequence, a symbolic sequence. If your vocabulary is large or your uh, time is large, you have a lot of time steps, it helps to use a sparse matrix representation. So instead of storing all these zeros explicitly as zeros, you just say, my matrix is entirely composed of zeros, except these few values, which you then explicitly uh, specify. That's a, it's called a sparse matrix representation, uh, which can help with these kinds of representations. They're just available in, in Keras. You don't have to build it yourself or anything. Uh, just something to, uh, to remember if you're actually going to do this. So this is one sequence in our data set. And if we have a data set of lots of sequences, lots of emails, lots of uh, songs, then we get lots of sequences, so lots of these matrices. But they don't all have the same size. So unlike the image case, we cannot make this make our whole data set a big three tensor, uh, because our uh, instances may have lots of different sizes. So this is kind of a, a problem that you need to work around. Usually what you do is you pad your sequences, so you just add some zero vectors here, so that most of them are the same size, and you can cluster them by size, so you have one batch of very long sequences and a larger batch of very s small sequences. That kind of depends on your data. That's something you have to work out for yourself, is how to turn this into batches, so that you can feed it in batches to your neural network algorithm. Uh, we won't go into that any further today. For now, we'll just assume that we feed our networks sequence by sequence. So the way we uh, look at sequences is not like this in one big matrix, but is step by step. As you're hearing me speak, you're interpreting each word at a time, and you are remembering some words while you're remembering. Uh, you're deciding to forget some words, and some words are very important, so you're spiking those up as I need to remember those words and you're building up a model of the sentence that I'm saying to you as I'm saying it, hopefully. So in order to make a neural network do that, what we can do is we can add a cycle. What we see here is basically plain old feed-forward network as we had before. So we have some input x, we have a hidden layer, and all the nodes in the hidden layer are connected to all the nodes in the input x, and then it goes to output y, it has some bias nodes, just as we've seen in the previous lecture on neural networks. But we also have some connections going back to some extra input nodes. So these are connections that don't feed forward, but they feed back to these three extra input nodes that are also connected to all of the hidden nodes, and they just copy over the hidden state. So this is our hidden layer, and it just gets uh, as the hidden layer feeds forward into Y, at the same time it gets copied into these nodes. So what you can do then is you can feed your network one input at a time. So we feed it one X, we compute the feed forward, we put the hidden state here, and then we feed it the next X, 
we compute the feed forward, we put the next hidden state here, and so on and so on. And our network operates in a cycle. Uh, this is a bit complicated, so we're going to develop something, uh, a little visual shorthand to make this a bit more uh, simple. So basically, this is a simple feed-forward network without cycles. We just have some x, we multiply it by some weights, and add a bias node, but we'll forget about the bias node for now, just imagine they're there. We multiply this by some weights, we get a hidden layer, we multiply that by some weights, and we get an output layer. So basic feed-forward network with no cycles. Oh yeah, and some, I need to credit. So the exposition that follows is uh, adapted pretty much one-on-one -on -one from this tutorial from Chris Ola. And normally I put my uh, dedication, my credits in the uh, slides PDF, but here I'm using so much of this tutorial that I felt I should mention it explicitly. It's a very good document, so please, if you want to really understand the uh, LSTMs, please read this, uh, this blog post. Back to the basic feed-forward network, right? This basic feed-forward network, we now represent it like this to simplify it. And we can now add the cycle like this. So we add an x, we get some hidden layer, we get some output layer, and then the hidden layer gets copied around and concatenated to the x. So this, when a cycle ends up like this in this uh, fork, uh, the source vectors from both sides get concatenated. And these weights W operate on the concatenation of this vector and this vector. Concatenation is just sticking them together. No, no. So the question is, does the size keep increasing with every step? Uh, no, just um, essentially if you write this out explicitly, you have your X and next to it the hidden layer from the previous step, which in the first step we just set this to zero. And the hidden layer always gets copied to this layer, but the input layer stays the same size. Uh, so now we can feed this model a time series. So we feed it x1, we get some h1 here, and h0 is, is set to zeros. And we get some y1 output, we compare it to some target y1. We're going to talk about the uh, backpropagation later. But we have some output and we can compare it to some target value. And then the next step, we move over the time series, so we get x2, uh, which computes to... Uh, oh yeah, and then h1 gets moved over to this, uh, this second input, gets concatenated to x2, to compute h2, and then fed forward, and so on and so forth. Oop. Yeah? No. Uh, oh, yeah. So the question is, is every x one uh, frame, or one, one slice in the time series, or is it every x one time series? So x is, uh, every x is one step in the time series, one frame or one slice in the time series. So x1 through 6 is the whole time series. Uh, so that works. We can just compute the forward pass, and given some weights, we get some output. So the question now is, how do we do backpropagation? How do we uh, train a neural network like this? How do we figure out what the, wa the weights v and w should be in order to... Uh, solve some learning problem, to do some prediction or to do some uh, classification. And the simplest way to, to see that, to see how that should work, is to unroll the network. So instead of seeing this as some sort of cycle that we feed, uh, feed one example at a time, we unroll it for all the time steps. So I've rotated the, the vectors 90 degrees to make it uh, clearer to see. And basically this is what we did at time step one. We fed it input x1, we set h0 to zero, we concatenate the two, we get h1, uh, we multiply by w, we get h1, we multiply by v, and we get some output. And then the next time step, we take this h1, concatenate it to x2, we multiply it by w, we get h2, we multiply it by v, and we get the second output. 
So this is basically what we did step by step by step. We just unroll the network through time. And now we get a big feed-forward network. This is just basically one big network with a lot of shared weights. So there are weights on all of these arrows, and they have to stay the same. Otherwise, it's not, it's not a cyclical network. So these weights all have to stay the same. But apart from that, this is just one big feed-forward network where we put some sequence on the input and we get some outputs. And then we can see for every output how much is it wrong, what's, the, what's our loss our loss on output y6. And if we then do backpropagation, we get automatically, it feeds back through the whole network and updates all these w's based on this loss that we've observed here. And the same thing happens for all the losses we observe at all the time steps, and they all feed back through the network. And everything gets updated automatically. The only thing we have to worry about is that these weights have to stay the same. So this weight here gets gradients from all these losses at the same time. Um, but essentially what we, uh, uh, that essentially boils down to using this multivariate chain rule of calculus, multivariate chain rule that we saw in the uh, first deep learning lecture. So we can do this, and this is basically something that something like TensorFlow or PyTorch can just handle for us. So now we have something that we can use for basically any kind of sequence learning uh, that we were uh, discussing before the break. So if we have an input sequence and an output sequence, we can build a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. That's what I've been drawing now. I've not shown the uh, starting age factor here, just to simplify things. So if we have some sequence and we have some known output sequence, we can do sequence-to-sequence -sequence uh, sequence -sequence learning. For instance, uh, you might do parallel translation. You need a very complicated neural network. to You put some English here and some French here, and you see if you can train English to French directly. And if you have a complicated enough recurrent neural network, you can do that. But closer to home, this um, prediction problems that we saw before the break are also a sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, task. So if I have a big data set, time series, and I want to predict at every point, given this, what's going to be the value of the next point, then I get basically a sequence of things that I want to predict, which is just my input sequence shift one step forward. So the whole thing, if I unroll it, this whole prediction problem becomes a sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning problem. So all of these prediction problems are basically sequence-to-sequence -sequence problems and can be solved if you want to with a recurrent neural network like this. We can also do, if we want to do, for instance, spam classification, then we want to we get a sequence as input and we want a single label as output. So we can do sequence-to-label, where we basically just ignore everything the neural network outputs until the last moment. So we get whatever it does here we don't care about, doesn't get any gradient here, doesn't put it, we don't put any loss functions on here. We only care about what it outputs at the last moment. Yeah. More important. Um, okay, so the question is, what if you... Um, so let's back to prediction for now. Uh, what if you have a prediction problem, but you want to... Uh, you have some kind of uh, differing importance between the previous steps. So you're looking at previous steps, but you're, you know that your most recent... Uh, step, the most recent thing you've observed is the most important. In the context of recurrent neural networks, you can just let the recurrent neural network learn that. You don't have to input it yourself, so you don't have to limit yourself to the last three steps. You can just feed it the whole sequence. Because, uh, yeah, you can just feed it the whole sequence. And if your loss function is just, just the prediction, then your neural network should figure out by itself 
that the last thing always has a high, the last step always has a high predictive power. So neural networks are just able to do this by themselves and you don't have to tell them. That's sort of in general the benefit of all these deep learning methods is that you have to tell them less of what you know about the data and they can figure more of it out themselves. Uh, yes, okay, uh, so that's a point. So when you backpropagate, all these Ws are the same. Um, but what you see here, so let's say I'm predicting value uh, Y6, and you're saying that the most immediate part of my history is the most important, so the value Y5 is the most predictive, right? Then I can, s if I set my weights so that it mostly ignores H4, and takes most of its information from Y5. Then you see that most of the information flows along this channel to the uh, prediction. Uh, so it uh, flows through here. Uh, and then it just, yeah, you set your weights to ignore the previous value. So in that sense, you set the weights to be the same, but they still describe this uh, kind of uh, stationary distribution. So if you want to do spam classification, you just ignore everything you're RNN outputs until its final vector, which is a label, or you interpret it as a label and you put only a loss function on the final thing. And then you can do sequence to label classification, or if you label it with a number instead of a, a category, you can do regression, sequence, uh, regression on sequences. Uh, you can do the other way around. So if you have a label and you want to output a sequence, for instance, you want to uh, generate poetry in some style. You input the style. Uh, strictly for symmetry, you might want to put just the label here and output the sequence, but actually it works a little bit better if you give the uh, network the same label on every input. So you just pick some label, let's say Shakespeare. You give it that label on every input, and then you generate a sequence, and it uses its memory to generate uh, the sequence, to give you a different output every time step. Uh, so all of these things you can solve with recurrent neural networks. If your input is a sequence, your output is a sequence, you can do it. If your input is a label, your output is a sequence, you can do it. If your input is a sequence, your output is a label, you can also do that. If both your input and your output are labels, you can also do it, but it doesn't really make sense to use a sequence in the middle. Uh, so these are three, three basic settings that make sense. Uh, and neural networks, as I've described, recurrent neural networks, as I've described so far, work reasonably well, but they have a bit of a problem with long-term memory processes, which is kind of what we want them for, right? That's kind of what we want them to do, is to remember things that are relevant for a long time. Otherwise, we might as well use a Markov model, because they are much simpler and they have these fixed memory, uh, they have the same memory problem, they don't remember things. And what we want these recurrent neural networks to do is to remember selectively things that happened a long time ago. So if you read a text like this, I was born in France, as a matter of fact, in a little village, blah, 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 when I moved to Amsterdam, so I'm fluent in, and then there are three options, French, Dutch, or aquarium. Uh, aquarium, even the Markov model will probably eliminate <laughs> aquarium, will give aquarium a very low probability. But Dutch and French, given just the recent history, I'm fluent in, French and Dutch are equally likely. They might have some prior probability from the data set, but they, are, they fit equally well. However, in the semantics of the sentence, if you look back far enough, you can remember that there was a sentence, I was born in France, I'm fluent in French, makes more sense. So that's essentially what the sentence is expressing. But in order to make that conclusion and in order to assign French a high probability, you need to remember this far back. And you have a fixed memory. So you cannot remember everything. You cannot rem just remember all these words, because at some point all your memory is going to run out. So you need to be selective. When you encounter a word, so born in France, you need to notice as you're encountering this word that that's an important word, that you probably should remember that. As a matter of fact, you should uh, when you encounter these words, you should recognize that these are not useful words, so you can forget about them village in Paris, blah, blah, blah. And at this point, hopefully this is still in your memory and you can recover it. And uh, recurrent networks 
in theory can do this. If you hand write their uh, if you write their weights by hand, you can set it so that they can do this kind of thing. But that's not what we want to do with neural networks. We don't want to write their weights by hand. We want to learn it. And unfortunately, if you learn them with backpropagation, they don't do this. They don't have these long memories. So what we have to do then is we have to change the architecture. Change the architecture so that they get this behavior, so that their memories become longer, as it were, and they uh, can forget further back. Uh, sorry, they can remember further back. And as I said, because you can't remember all the words, the key to remembering far back is forgetting. Forgetting the things that aren't relevant so that you can remember the things that are relevant, because you have limited memory. So that's the long, long short term memory. Uh, will do that for us, which is a specific recurrent neural network, a specific way of wiring up a recurrent neural network, one of these networks with a cycle in it. And it has these specific mechanisms wired into it for forgetting and selecting uh, that allow it to learn how to forget stuff easily without telling it what to forget. So it, uh, when the forgetting mechanism fires is learned from the data, but the forgetting mechanism is hard-coded into the architecture. And this was probably the first successful deep neural network. Uh, convolutional neural nets were one year later, so this was probably the first time we could actually train a deep neural network and make it do something uh, successfully. And uh, if you zoom out, this is what LSTMs look like. They basically have <laughs> your input and your output, and in between they have these cells, LSTM cells. And these cells have two uh, things that they pass to the next cell. Firstly, the cell state, C, which is basically a little bit like the hidden vector. It just, this contains its memory. This is just a vector containing its memory, all the stuff that it's decided to remember. And the output from the previous step, it also passes along. So this is just Y3 passed along again. And inside these cells, some complicated things are going to happen, for which we need a little bit more shorthand. So as we've seen already, we will denote concatenation of vectors like this, like this fork coming into, a, into an arrow. The application of weights we will denote by writing a W or a, a capital uh, letter on top of the line. Then the application of a sigmoid activation, so a sigmoid nonlinearity. We use this symbol. So here we have basically a very standard, fully connected neural network layer. You multiply by some weights, you apply sigmoid act activation, and you get some vector out of it. Uh, there's also something called a tan H activation. There's my wiper. Uh, which is basically, I think I mentioned it very briefly, but if you're sigmoid what your sigmoid does is it takes the range between negative infinity and positive infinity and it squeezes it using this s curve into the range between 0 and 1 the tan h is basically this function but stretched out a little bit so it squeezes the same range the same domain sorry into the range between minus 1 and plus one. So 10h is just sigmoid, but stretched out a little bit so that the smallest value is minus one. Um, and then occasionally, so there are vectors traveling along these arrows. Occasionally, we want to take an element-wise operation. So we want to sum two vectors or multiply two vectors. And we represent that with a little circle like this. So now we can diagram out what the inside of one of these cells looks like, which is a little bit complicated, but we'll go into it in, uh, in some detail. So there's time? Yeah, we have time. Uh, so basically here, but here, just to point out, here are the weights of your LSTM layer. They're down here. Let me just give you a second to drink this in. So the main thing to focus on in the LSTM is this line up here. 
which is a kind of conveyor belt of the cell state. So we have the previous cell state, the things the LSTM has decided to remember, represented in a big vector. And it travels along this conveyor belt to the next cell state. So it's, it's manipulated a little bit along the conveyor belt, and then uh, the LSTM cell, cell says to the next cell, this is what I want you to remember for the future. And it's manipulated only at two points. So here, uh, we uh, do an element-wise multiplication with another vector, which is essentially telling us, this is what I want, to want you to forget. And here we do an element-wise addition, which is telling us, this is what I want you to add to the memory. So we get here a vector, which is a bit like a bit mask. So if, uh, if the incoming vector here from below is all zeros, then we forget everything, because everything is multiplied by zero, so the whole vector is reset to zero. If the incoming vector here is all ones, then it says remember everything, because it just stays the same. And this vector is, um, using a sigmoid function, I the incoming vector from below here is configured so that all values are between 0 and 1. So are somewhere between 0, forget it, and 1, remember it. Then once you've forgotten stuff, you can add stuff to it. So ideally, uh, you would want to s clean out a cell here by multiplied by z multiplying by zero, or in the extreme case, you'd say, uh, clean out this cell, forget this cell entirely, set it to zero, and then I'm going to add some new value to it. And then I'm passing it on to the next cell. So that's our memory traveling along this conveyor belt. And then the network has to provide these bit masks, sort of soft bit masks, that tell us what to forget and what to, uh, what to add to the memory. So first, the forgetting vector, wf, is basically built on the output of the previous cell. Remember this, along this line, we traveled the output of the previous cell, and the new input. And that passes through a basic fully connected neural network. So we apply some weights to the concatenation of these two vectors. We apply a sigmoid function, so we get a vector of values between 0 and 1. And that's our forgetting or forgetting mask. So depending on these weights, these weights determine, based on the previous output and the next input, what we're going to forget. And the these weights are trained, so we don't know exactly how they, uh, how they do what they do, but they learn to do this. So now we've cleared out our vector, and we need to decide what to add to the vector. So we have the same concatenation as input here. Uh, and we get a uh, neural network with a 10H activation. It's in purple, so this is 10H. That decides what we're going to, what we would like to add. And then we get another mask on top of that that can sort of tune how much of that we would like to add. So these are values between 0 and 1 because you might want to subtract stuff from your memory or add stuff to your memory. And then there's another value that, um, another mask on top of that, before it gets added to the memory, that determines whether or not, uh, how much of each we want to add, how much of each cell in this uh, vector we want to add. So that's what we then add to the memory. So then our manipulations of the memory are complete. So we send the memory onto the next cell to do with what they like. But we still need to determine in this cell what we're going to <coughs> provide as output. Am I out of time? No. <laughs> what we're going to provide. We still need to decide what we're going to provide as output. So for that, the memory is first squeezed through a 10H activation again. So this memory has, can be any, any range. Can be, uh, all the values in the memory can be anything between negative and positive infinity. So for the output, we squeeze it through 10H, so that it uh, becomes between 0 and 1. We get another uh, sigmoid activation that decides what we're going to output. So based on the input and the output from the previous cell, we get another mask here that decides what we're going to output. We do a 
uh, element-wise multiply with this 10 h input from the uh, conveyor belt, and that becomes our output and gets passed to the next cell also as the output. So that in five minutes is how the LSTM cell works. Um, like I said, uh, have a look at the blog post where they also use diagrams like this to explain it. Uh, you can put the formulas next to it, which actually in this case help. Um, no. Uh, the question is, is the WO the same as what you would have without memory? Uh, but the WO uses uh, both the output from the previous layer and the input from this layer as input. So the WO is essentially, if you want to reduce this to the previous recurrent neural network, the non-LSTM neural network, you could scratch out all of this and just use the WO and remove all of this, and then you would sort of more or less reduce it to the old neural network, the old recurrent neural network. So that's a lot of uh, complicated stuff. So what do we get out of this? What does it buy us? As usual, I have to rush through the payoff. But basically, you can use this LSTM, uh, well, you can use it to do lots of different things. But one of the most interesting things is to use it as a language model. So to use it, you train it to predict this kind of distribution. And it's not a Markov model. It doesn't have a finite memory. It has a potentially infinite memory. So we give it the whole previous, all the words we've observed up till now, whole sequence could be a whole book, and tell it, predict the next word for us. The way you train it is, is very simple. You just put your sequence on the input. So this is a text that you put on the input as a sequence. And as the output, you just put the next word. So after the word you, you should predict the word half. And after the word half, you should predict the word one, and so on and so on. Should just Take your text, shift it one word over, and make that the output. Then you do a bunch of training passes to update these weights. And then you get a language model over words. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so what um, yeah, what, what batch size, as it were, uh, would you like to train on? So do you want to train on one page at a time or a whole book the at the time or, or what? Um, essentially, that differs, but I guess, well, it's, there are two things to consider. You have the size of your memory. If you do the whole book, then it, your model, your entire unrolled model won't fit into memory. And if you do... Uh, so if you do something like paragraphs, it will usually be enough to fit into memory. So I think usually you train on paragraphs because they have a nice memory, LSTMs, but they don't remember like the whole book back. So paragraph is about as long as your memory gets. So that's usually a good middle way. Um, but you don't have to uh, train it on words. You can also train it on the characters. So we split the sequence into characters. And we do the same thing. So now the model doesn't know about words. It just knows about characters. So our one hot vectors become a lot smaller. That's nice. But our unrolled network becomes a lot longer. Our sequences become a lot longer. Uh, oh, yeah. And just to uh, remind you, the output here is a softmax layer. So what you get on the output is a probability distribution on the characters, over characters. So you train it like this. And then you can sample from it. <laughs> uh, then you can sample from it. So you don't unroll the network. You train it, and then you don't unroll it for sampling. You feed it first a small seed sequence, just like we did with the Markov model. And then you, tell it, you ask it to predict the next word. You get a probability distribution on words. From that distribution, you sample one word. You feed it that word as the next input. You get a probability distribution on the next word. And like that, you sample. So you get this output distribution over all uh, words or over all characters, I should say. You sample from that, you feed it, and you cycle the sampling. And then you essentially do the same thing as we did with the um, Markov model. You generate some, uh, some text on the character level. 
Uh, these examples are all from this blog post. There are basically two blog posts if you want to learn about LSTMs. You read this blog post and the other one I linked. So this one has some good examples of these language models. Basically, with, let's start with Shakespeare again. Uh, so it looks a little bit more grammatical and a little bit more convincing than the previous time. But remember, this time we are training on just the characters. We're not training on words, we're training on characters. So the fact that should and sleep and away and miseries are words are all inferred from just this relatively small corpus of all Shakespeare's uh, plays. And it's not just learning relatively grammatical text, it's also learning meter. If you read this out, it sounds like a Shakespeare play. Uh, yeah, the question is, how does it know where to place the spaces? Uh, I think the spaces are also characters. So we have about 50 characters, probably. <coughs> I guess, well, probably it's, it's uh, 128, so just the ASCII character set. You can do this on Wikipedia as well. You get a bit more text. And what you see here, if you've never edited Wikipedia before, this is how links are edited in Wikipedia. And again, this is just on characters. So what it's learning here is that when it... Somewhere it starts with two, uh, two opening brackets. Somewhere down the line, it should put two closing brackets. And it always does that correctly. And the um, things it puts these opening and closing brackets around look like the things that would be links in a reasonable Wikipedia article. So they're uh, uh, proper nouns, uh, refer things referring to, well, what look to ref be referring to a group of people, Countries, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes there are links to external URLs, which don't exist. Because it doesn't know about the internet, it doesn't have access to the internet. So it just hallucinates URL. It knows it should start with HTTP colon slash less, because it's seen lots of URLs. And then it just hallucinates a very realistic looking Yahoo URL. Sometimes parts of... Um, Wikipedia text contain XML, snippets of XML, and it can hallucinate that as well. So it just hallucinates XML, which doesn't make any sense, but it is correctly formatted. So there is an opening and a closing tag, and this, all, this is all valid XML, from, uh, not from any, any, reason, uh, any existing specification, but uh, there is a closing tag for every opening tag. And finally, this is sort of the most impressive part, they, what they did, they uh, got a big bunch of LaTeX. If you know, if you've ever written anything in LaTeX yourself, you know how difficult it is to get it to compile. Uh, it didn't compile from scratch, but it almost compiled from scratch. So they got a big bunch of uh, LaTeX, they generated some LaTeX, and they had to fix a couple of things before it compiled. But then basically you get something like this. So all of these languages, so how to specify formulas and how to do diagrams, there should be a diagram in there, there's a little enumerate here. It's learned all of these things. Probably the most famous example is the Deep Trump Twitter account, which is trained on tweets by Trump and gets relatively realistic uh, Trump-sounding uh, tweets. Um, So that's, um, I'm almost done, but the um, thing here is that it, uh, you're learning a predictive model. So you're learning a model of the next character, given what you've seen so far. Uh, but sometimes what you want to do is learn a model over specific sentences, right? So what if you want to generate, instead of just generating a bit of text, you want to generate bits of tweets in isolation. You want to generate one tweet and then another tweet, instead of sort of giving it a seed and then letting it continue on, letting it continue on. Um, what you can do then is you can take this uh, generated model that we talked about earlier, where you start with some neural network and you feed it a uh, standard normal vector. And you can do that with an LSTM. So you sample some standard normal vector, you feed it to all the inputs, and you get an output sequence, and then you train this so that the output sequences look like your data set, using a variational autoencoding. 
So you get your autoencoder that trains, that maps your input to a Z, to a latent vector. And then you get, uh, so you have an encoder that maps your data to a latent vector, and then you have a decoder that maps your latent vector to an output. Then you get the kind of stuff we've already seen. So you get this very nice model over sequences where everything translates uh, very nicely if you interpolate in the latent space. Uh, well, just very quickly, just to show you how uh, this works. So this is the image captioning uh, example I showed you earlier. You get some image and you automatically produce an out a text captioning the image. First, you need some examples. So the, it's the MS Coco data set, which gives us a huge amount of pictures with some captions. And then you just pick one of these uh, convolutional neural networks like the VGG network, you just download it. Somebody else has trained it, you don't have to do that. You take the output, you cut off a couple of layers so the output is a nice vector, vector representation of this image. You stick that vector representation into an LSTM, and you train the whole thing end-to-end -end on this MS Coco data set. And what you get is pretty good captions. If you want really good captions, you need to add something called an attention network. We won't talk about that. But if you just do this, this already works pretty well for captioning. Uh, yeah, uh, if you want to do word level as, um, LSTMs, you need to combine the embeddings. Uh, uh, well, it helps to combine the embeddings with LSTMs. There are some other uh, architectures that I won't go into. So, summary: What did we talk about today? We talked about sequence modeling. Some things you talk about, you need to think about Markov models. Very useful models for model modeling uh, sequences, word to vec useful model for modeling words, and finally LSTMs, very powerful, uh, slightly magical ways to really, really model language. So sorry for going over time, and I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs>